My name is Lucy, but you all can call me Lucy, and I'm a developer on the Bolt team. Uh, and one piece of advice that I've been given about public speaking is to gain the trust of your audience. Sometimes I'm making them laugh, um, but I want to gain your trust by telling you that I've lied to you. Um, the, this talk is not exclusively about best practices, mostly because um, when I think of a best practice, I think of like a process or a workflow, maybe a set of guidelines. Um, and as I was putting this talk together, I realized that I wanted to talk more about some of the concrete uh, things that you can do with Bolt, uh, some of the common pitfalls that people run into, um, and just some general like kind of tips and tricks. So uh, this is really more of a like bolt tips and tricks talk. And there will definitely be some uh, kind of higher level guidelines that we'll talk about, but a lot of it's gonna be uh, kind of nitty gritty um, what, like how to, how to get the most out of using bolt. Uh, so think a little bit more like Buzzfeed listicle and a little bit less like self-help book um, with this talk. So as I was developing the talk, uh, I think that the first question to ask is, what makes something a best practice? Like, why am I going to recommend any of the things I'm going to recommend to you? Um, and so there's four kind of pillars that we want to drive your bulk content towards. Um, so that's making sure that your content is modular. So making sure that you are writing tasks and plans that do one thing and do it well, and then composing those into more meaningful workflows. Um, we also want to make sure that you're writing content that's usable so that if someone uh, comes across any of the content that you're writing, uh, they can understand how to use it, hopefully without pinging you directly. And keep in mind here that that person might be you six months from now. Um, so, so making sure that like, people can understand what your content is doing. Also making sure that it's reusable. Uh, so if I want to integrate your plan into my own workflow, am I able to do that? Kind of going back to similar to is it modular, um, but like am I able to repurpose it um, for other things, reuse it? Um, and then lastly, making sure it's maintainable. Again, either by you six months from now uh, or by someone else in your organization. Making sure that it's readable, making sure that people can understand it, making sure that like uh, it follows good code practices, et cetera. Um, so hopefully by the end of this talk, um, some of these best practices will help you avoid a lot of the common pitfalls that we see people fall into with Bolt, um, and also create content that others can use and maintain. So that's kind of the, the outcome for this talk. The very first topic that I want to cover is writing plans, mostly because I think it's both the most interesting topic and also one of the most common ones that uh, we get questions about. And the first question that you're probably going to ask yourself when you go to write a plan is, should it be in YAML or Puppet? And oftentimes when we get this question, I think that people think that the Bolt team prefers one over the other or thinks that like we're trying to like push you towards one or the other. And that's definitely not the case. We wrote both because both are really useful and we fully support both. We're not like only adding features to one, nothing like that. Uh, with all of that said, the YAML and Puppet plans are subtly different. Um, so YAML, because it is a data serialization language, it doesn't have uh, control logic. So it doesn't have branching or if statements, uh, for loops, things like that. Um, whereas Puppet plans, because they are a scripting language, do have some of that. And one really important feature that that enables is more fine-grained error handling. So I can say, if these set of nodes error, then handle it this way. Otherwise, continue on, that kind of thing. So that's the, the main uh, technical difference, I think, between YAML and Puppet plans in terms of like capabilities. Um, another thing that I think that you need to take into account when you're deciding whether to write a plan in YAML or Puppet is just the familiarity with the language of you and the people at your organization. Going back to that idea of maintainability, uh, I think that just because it's the one you know best is a really good reason to choose one or the other. Um, like not having to learn a whole new language and probably making some mistakes in that language and um, having people in the future have to learn it as well. Um, using whatever you're most comfortable with I think is a great way to get started. Um, the last thing I'll say here is one really common workflow that we see people follow 
is they'll start writing their plan in YAML. And then once they need to add more complexity to it, then YAML allows. We have a command line command, which is bolt plan convert, which will convert a plan from YAML to Puppet. And then you can just add in um, the air handling, the branching, like whatever complexity you need to add to your Puppet code. Um, and so that's a pretty easy way to uh, kind of get the best of both worlds, use one when you need it. Um, so like I said, both are great options um, and just do what works for you. Um, yeah, both great options, slice of pizza, bun your pants. Um, the next thing that you're probably going to run into is documenting your plans. And right now, we don't have a great way of displaying plan documentation. So there's no, um, your documentation won't get displayed when you run bolt plan show, like it will with bolt task show. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't document your plans. Um, so the way that we recommend doing this is using puppet strings, which is the inline documentation tool for most puppet things. Um, hopefully most people are familiar with it. If not, there's a booth downstairs actually at the like Puppet Experience Center uh, for Puppet Strings. Um, but it's a way of uh, having your documentation in line in your code. And then you can generate either HTML or Markdown or I think other Markdown up languages um, from that data. Um, and so if you want to see an example of this in the... Um, Canary plan, which ships with Bolt, we have exactly that. So we have a summary of what the Canary plan does. We have a list of parameters. And down here we have what it returns and an example. Um, so I've already run the strings generation. And so, um, boop, boop. Uh, so this doc folder is what that generates. And then uh, you can see the puppet plans one there. And I'll oh, go back a slide and maybe switch over to a uh, file viewer. And also maybe not. No, there we go. OK. Boop, boop, boop. All right. So this is an example of like the HTML that is generated. Uh, so you have your list of parameters, et cetera. Uh, you can have this either hosted, uh, like served to somewhere in your organization. You can have it in Markdown just right next to your plans. Um, however you want to like have people be able to find this, um, I think works well. Um, got it. <laughs> um, uh, and a little bit of inside baseball information. When we do add a bolt plan show command, we're planning to build it on puppet strings. So your documentation efforts will not be for naught. Eventually, that will be probably what we support um, for displaying the documentation both uh, on the command line, in Puppet Enterprise, on the forge, all of that. Um, the next question that comes up kind of frequently is how to parse result set objects. So when you run a task command or script within a plan, any of these functions will return what's called a result set object. Um, it is an actual object, so the main part of it is the array of result objects, but it does also have a couple of functions on it. So you can filter it, um, you can iterate over it, result sets are iterable. Um, and you can verify that all of the results in the set are okay or succeeded. Um, all that's documented in the docs. Um, so there's a couple of nice things that result sets give you. And then, like I said, uh, the, the main part of the result set is the array of results. And a result object is just the output of whatever you ran on a single node. So the result set then aggregates across all of your nodes that ran um, all of those results. And uh, from there, you can get like the values of whatever you were running. So there's lots of ways that you can use both of these objects. Um, I'm only going to be showing like the way that kind of worked for the project I was working on. Um, and that is upgrading Python. 
So for, for those that don't know, I hate to tell you, but Python 2 is end of life -ing, January 1st of 2020. Um, so I wrote a plan that will check if Python 2 is the default Python installed. Um, and if it is, then it will install Python 3 and set that as the default instead. Uh, obviously, mer like moving from Python 2 to Python 3 involves probably a lot more than that, but um, this is the part that was easy to automate. So um, the first thing I want to show you is uh, I have my run command. So I'm checking the Python version um, and including this catch errors which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and I'm saving that to a variable. And then with that variable, so this is the result set object. And with that, I can get the set of nodes that succeeded, so everything that did not error. Um, and I can filter that. Uh, there's a filter command, which will return an array. Um, and then a filter set, which will return another result set. Um, so I'm going to use the filter set uh, and so that this Python 2 is also a result set object. Um, and I'm going to filter it by everything that matched Python 2. And the reason that I want this to be a result set object is that then later in my plan, I can refer to the targets um, really easily. So instead of having to like loop over an array and get all the targets, that's already available if this is a result set object. Um, so then I can operate on those nodes um, individually and like run commands on them, print things, et cetera. Um, I'm going to keep coming back to this plan, but I will give it a run now. Uh, Puppetize, upgrade, Python. Mission VMs. And I have just a couple of virtual machines, so hopefully networking won't be an issue. I just know it'll work. <laughs> Total confidence. <laughs> uh, so we print all of the targets that have two and that have three. And then at the end, I print and make sure that uh, the two that had um, Python 2 installed, so if I go up a little, um, we can see that there's two target objects here. Uh, one is on port 2200, the other is on 2201. And then there's one that already has Python 3 installed, so like I don't need to do anything with that. Um, so then on these two, we run the commands, uh, reprint the version to make sure that it actually updated, and it did. All right? Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> um, all right, so. Um, like I said, I'll keep coming back to this to demonstrate other like plan properties, but um, coming back to parsing result objects, that's uh, one way in which they can be really useful. Um, you might have also seen uh, a little bit of error handling in the plan. Uh, I did not have time to have a node that actually errors, but, um, but I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about it anyway. Um, the plan fails, so a plan will fail whenever any function fails on any target by default. But you can avoid this if you either use the underscore catch underscore errors meta parameter to any of your functions that support it, or you can use a catch errors block. So that's a function that you pass a block to, and then any errors that get raised in that block um, will be returned from the catch errors function. Um, so either of those totally works, and those are what allow you to handle errors and continue executing. And then um, you also have access to a function that will fail a plan if you need to fail a plan. So coming back to this example, um, I, because this is a result object, have, can just uh, get the error set from that. And then for each error, I want to check to see if it's command not found which basically just means Python wasn't installed, um, and I probably don't care about upgrading Python 2 then. Um, so if that's the case, then I don't care. The plan will just move on. But if that's not the case, then something really wrong probably happened, and I want to just fail the plan and know about it. Um, so this is, uh, again, like a, a good way of being able to handle errors in Puppet some of the, 
the nice air handling features that you get. Um, logging in plans, another topic that comes up pretty frequently. We have recently added a function called out clone clone message. Um, and this is what we encourage you to use for printing things, basically, uh, especially to standard out. So for debugging, it's really useful, or just for communicating to your user what's happening. Um, kind of going back to that pillar of usability, making sure that when people run their plan, they know what's happening as it's executing. Um, you also have uh, log functions. So um, all the common ones, error warning, notice, info, debug. Um, and you can use notify in an apply block if you want to have something notify from within uh, puppet code that's embedded in your plan. Um, the last thing that can kind of trip people up sometimes is that the default log level for plans, at least in Bolt, is warn. Um, and you can configure that in your Bolt configuration. So coming back, um, I think we've already seen this, but I used two different um, outputs here. Uh, so I used out message to uh, just demonstrate that that's like how you print things, and I used warn to demonstrate that it'll like show up in yellow um, or warning. Uh, just, yeah, that log function is available. Um, so it's a really great way to, like I said, make sure that people are able to use and reuse the content that you're writing, know what's happening. Uh, the last topic that I want to cover with regards to writing plans is testing your plans. And I think that this is something that not a lot of the plan authors that we talk to think too much about, or maybe they have one test that uh, like just makes sure the plan runs and succeeds, um, which is useful, but like, I think we can do a little better. So with Bolt, we ship a Bolt spec library that you can use for testing uh, both tasks and plans in Bolt. And it's not um, like stable. It's, it's not done yet, I would say. I guess nothing is. Um, uh, but uh, it's the best we have now. And it is what we on the Bolt team use to test plans and tasks that we write. Um, so specifically, we have within that a plans library that you can use to unit test your plans without having to run them on actual nodes. Um, most of the documentation for this is inline in the code, but it is actually pretty good. Uh, and there's a couple of examples as well. Uh, I will publish the docs. Uh, I'll put a link probably in Slack and maybe on Twitter or something. Um, but these links will be clickable. Um, and yeah. You can also use uh, the Bolt Spec library to write acceptance tests that will actually run your plans uh, and verify the output of them. So um, I have here a upgrade Python spec. Um, pretty simple, it just pulls in the Bolt Spec plans library, and then this just sets up the module path, the spec helper. Um, but you can do that manually with our spec as well, just set the module path. Um, this loads Puppet and initializes the logger. And then I want to, this line is key, include uh, bolt spec plans, which gives me all the functions that I desire with it. So um, for each uh, command, task, script, and I think plan, uh, we have expect and allow uh, functions, which will either expect that something gets run or allow it to get run, uh, just like normal RSpec. Um, so uh, in this test, I basically test like most of the things I can. So I expect that this command gets run. Um, we have an expect out message function that will expect out message to get called. Um, and then a couple more expect commands and then I can run the plan and make sure that the result is okay. So boop, boop. Yay. Um, so that's a great way to add some unit testing to your plans and not have to like spin up a whole bunch of infrastructure to verify that they're actually working. Um, and going back to kind of the four principles, this makes your code usable and reusable, making sure that it's actually correct, making sure that other people who are maybe helping you or contributing to it are able to verify that their work is correct. 
Um, yeah, pretty, pretty good stuff. All right, with that, uh, the next thing that I want to talk about, pivoting, pivoting topics a little, is configuration. Um, this is another thing that uh, I think has, um, like the Bolt team has a specific way of thinking about configuring Bolt, um, and so I want to guide you through kind of what, what, how we think about it. Um, so the first thing that you're going to want to set up as you start developing with Bolt is a project directory. So a project directory encapsulates all of the config code and data that Bolt is going to use when you run it. Um, worth noting, there are multiple places where your project directory can be defined, but only one of them will be used every time that you use Bolt. So we don't merge project directories from, like if you have a user level one at tilde puppet labs bolt and also a local one, uh, we're not going to use both of them and merge them. We just use your local one. Um, so bolt will only use one project directory. Uh, it'll treat any directory with a bolt.yaml or a bolter directory as the project directory. And that's what we refer to as a local or embedded project directory. If you don't have either of those, then the default is what we call a user level project directory, and that goes in your home dir at .puppetlabs slash bolt. Um, and this is where you'll have like your bolt.yaml, your inventory.yaml, all of the modules that you're using, uh, or at least the ones that you're probably developing. Um, although worth noting, your project directory can be in your module path, but your module path is totally separate from like you can define your module path separately from the project directory, worth noting. Um, the last thing that I, I wanna say that has tripped some people up is to keep your modules that you are actively working on in the bolter slash site dash modules. We've seen a couple of people that use bolter slash modules um, because that would make sense. But that is the first directory on the module path by default. And when you go to do bolt puppet file install, it overwrites that. Um, luckily, the people that we were talking to had saved their work in GitHub, so it wasn't a huge deal, but um, definitely got you to look out for is make sure that everything that you actually care about lives in site dash modules. Um, so coming back here, uh, since I have my bolt.yaml defined here, uh, then this is my project directory, and I actually totally cheated. Nick Maludi's sitting there laughing. Um, so like I said, I have my module path. I made sure modules was the first one so that if I ever go to install, it installs where I think it will and doesn't overwrite my stuff. And then I just made my module path dot dot so that this module would like get loaded. Um, and then I also have my inventory file here. Uh, so using product directories is a really good way of separating your data from the actual bolt content that you're writing. Um, and that makes it easy to pass this data off to someone who shares your environment and make sure that it stays separate from people who don't share your environment. Um, so it helps keep things modular, helps make sure that other people outside of your organization can use them, et cetera. It's a good way of like encapsulating um, everything that Bolt cares about uh, in a pretty finite space. Uh, another thing that we've been working a lot on is plugins. Um, how many people have like heard of or used a plugin yet? Oh, yes. Oh, exciting. Yay, so much opportunity for people to use plugins. So plugins, as you might have guessed, allow you to customize Bolt's behavior based on your environment. So they let you uh, kind of configure how Bolt's going to be acting. For now, for the most part, this has taken shape as inventory plugins. So that lets you dynamically load inventory into your inventory.yaml so you don't have literally hundreds line long inventory files that are just node host names that change all the time. Um, we do have one other plugin, Bolt Library, which, or a Puppet Library, which will define the behavior when the apply prep function uh, for your plans is called. So it basically defines how Puppet gets installed on the remote system when you need it to be installed during a plan run. So that allows you to um, run your own custom puppet install task or install a different version than just the default one or install it from your own local repo, um, defining that kind of behavior. 
Um, you can use the built-in plugins that we have for either loading the inventory or for the Puppet library, or you can write your own as tasks. Um, so yeah, there's, let me actually show you. Uh, so I actually have here a task plugin that I'm using to load all of my vagrant VMs that are local uh, into the inventory instead of having like the IP and all the configuration. So I'm running a task that's called bolt vagrant. Um, and then just like anything, I can set some config, but like this is really like these two lines are defining my plugin. Um, and I can briefly show you what that task actually looks like. Uh, boop, boop. Um, so basically we use the vagrant ssh config command um, and then just parse that into the actual data that Bolt needs uh, in order to load it into the inventory and then uh, output it as JSON. And that's about it. When you um, are writing your own task, uh, this is looking a little bit further ahead. We're working right now on the idea of reference plugins. So those are plugins that will uh, basically be a reference to whatever the plugin is. And then when uh, that reference needs to be resolved, it's lazily resolved. And it'll basically call out to the plugin and then load the output from the plugin in place into the inventory. So that allows you to, previously with, with inventory plugins, you could only really load like a list of tasks or a config structure. But now you can actually load like a whole group or a whole group tree or some other section of the inventory in place into the inventory. And then the inventory will get um, like merged. So all of your configurations will get merged with the resolved plugins. Um, so that's how it's going to work like two weeks from now. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, one last gotcha is that inventories don't have context. This has tripped a couple of people up. Um, so the data for a target is computed at runtime. Like I said, plugins are lazily resolved um, at runtime. Uh, the inventory is read, uh, and with the exception of result plugins, the entire inventory is read. So if I'm only running on one group, I still pick up the configuration for the targets in that group from the whole inventory. Um, and so with the exception of resolve references. Uh, and so that means that the config from every instance of a target in the inventory is what gets merged and used and not just the config that you have set on the group or the node that you're running on. Does that kind of make sense? Um, so yeah, includes group and target specific config um, and uh, the inventory gets merged from right to left as well on the inventory tree. So basically your child groups take precedence over their parent groups. Um, yeah, worth noting. Um, boop. All right, the next topic I want to cover is writing tasks. Um, so the first question that you'll probably ask yourself when you go to write a task is, should it be a script or a task? Like when should I convert my script into a task? Um, as a little refresher, a, a task is basically just a script with metadata. We already kind of saw here, I have literally just a Ruby script and then some JSON next to it that has like a description and describes um, the parameters for it, et cetera. Um, so there's a couple of differences between scripts and tasks. Once again, we're not encouraging you to use one or the other. Both are great for whatever you need them for. Um, but they're just a little bit different. So scripts can print to standard error and accept command line arguments, just like a normal script. Um, whereas tasks have a standard API. So there you're passing arguments in either on standard in or as environment variables through Bolt. Um, and that's really great because it makes it easy to get structured data back out of them uh, if you're using them in a plan. But if you're just running the script itself, you might not need that. 
Um, tests also have metadata, which helps make them more usable and reusable. So making sure that, uh, that other people who come across your task know what it does, know what parameters it takes, know how to use it. Um, and especially in Puppet Enterprise now, you can like enforce the types of your parameters so you don't have to do that type checking in the script itself, um, et cetera. Um, so the main difference, a uh, couple of differences, um, just make sure you add a little metadata. Um, and speaking of that metadata, oh, okay, uh, is test metadata. You should use it. Um, like, yeah, I feel like this is the most obvious slide, I think, in my whole talk. But uh, you should give your task a description so that someone else or you next year know what it does. Um, a couple of other input or uh, metadata things that I think are worth defining. Um, one is to set private if you want to hide a task from bolt task show output. Um, so maybe it's something you're currently working on. Maybe it's something only your team is really using, but it's part of a module that you want to ship other things with. Um, so people will have it in their environment. You can use private to hide it um, so that only you are using it. Um, you probably will want to specify an input method. And the reason for this, um, taking, taking a step back, there's three input methods uh, for tasks. So there's PowerShell, um, there's as environment variables, and there's over standard in. And for uh, the SSH transport, uh, standard in and environment variables are the main ones we care about. Um, and the reason you want to specify an input method is that you're probably using one or the other. Most people don't both read parameters from standard in and also use environment parameters. And there's weird edge cases with both environment parameters and standard in parameters that you may run into if you have both getting set, but you are only using one of them. So essentially what you want to do is avoid the weird edge case and just set your input method to whichever one you're actually using. Um, and the last thing you want to do is assign types to your parameters. Like I said, this makes sure that people who are using your task, like know how to use it or using it correctly, can avoid silly mistakes like having an integer, something that should be an integer, actually be a string, that kind of thing. Um, makes it easier to use, easier to document, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing that we have built that you might find really helpful as you're writing your tasks is task helpers. So we have one for Python and one for Ruby. So if your tasks are written in those languages, you can use them. Um, and they provide a class that does two things, which enables a third thing. So they handle error generation. Um, they parse JSON input and serialize JSON output. And both of those together make testing your task a little bit easier. Um, so they're both shipped as Puppet modules. So you just include them in your Puppet file and then bolt Puppet file install. Um, and then all you need to do is inherit from the, t the class that they provide, and you're good to go. So I have the Ruby task helper up here, and I'm literally just gonna use the examples that are in this repo. Um, so we can see here um, I have a my task, which is in Ruby. Um, because we like ship this, we do a little bit of fancy checking to find where to load the task helper class from. So we just do that. And then uh, we have the actual task itself inherit from that task helper class. And then I can set any of the parameters that are required here. And any additional parameters will get picked up in this keyword args array. And then uh, all that this task does is returns um, a hash, uh, some data that just says, hello, my name is name. And then key part, uh, when this class gets called, we make sure that the task gets run. And this run uh, function is kind of magic from the task helper class that will actually execute it. So then in my examples, task test, um, this makes it really easy to uh, pass in parameters over standard in, 
make sure that the output is what I expect it to be. So expect standard out to receive print without, and then just run the task. Um, so in this way, the task helper helps, uh, like I said, serialize the JSON input and the output. Uh, and yeah, so really quick. Um, examples, task, task. Yay, it ran. <laughs> Um, so that's task helpers. Boom. Last thing I want to talk about with tasks is testing them. Uh, so similar to plans, we had the bolt spec run, which allows you to make assertions about the output of tasks. So that's what allows you to basically run a task from Ruby. So it's kind of bolts as a library almost. Um, one little tip is that using JSON parameters and returns will make your life a little easier, like I demonstrated with the task helpers. Um, and uh, another tip is that when you print a single JSON object from your task, that's what gets returned from the task, either in testing or if you're calling run task within a plan. So in that way, you can return structured data from your task, um, usually, uh, the result object or result set object is returned. Um, and if you specify this, then the, your structured data is what gets returned. So what was I going to show? Um, boop, boop. Oh, I remember. Uh, so if we look at the reboot tasks, um, oh. I want to show you spec uh, acceptance tasks. OK, here we go. Um, so this is using the bolt spec run. And this is actually running the task on some, I think, Docker containers that we bring up with uh, this inventory. Um, and yeah, make so you call run task. And then you can get the results and make sure that the result has all of the, like, the correct status, the correct output, um, et cetera. Oh. Testing made easy. <laughs> Hopefully it's as you expected. OK. Uh, the last topic that I want to cover is actually using Bolt. Um, so this is kind of a miscellaneous category for all the other things that I basically wanted to talk about, but wasn't really sure where they fit into the rest of the talk. Um, the first thing is covering defaults. I think some of the defaults, like all of these are documented, but they're not like all in one place. So I just wanted to kind of go over them. Um, the default user is for SSH etsy.getLogin, which will sometimes behave kind of weirdly on OSX machines for some reason, but that's basically just the user that you are currently running as is like the default, default, default. Like if you have no user set anywhere, um, that's what gets used. For Windows, you just have to configure a user. Um, yeah. Uh, the working directory when you remote into a machine is not well defined. Like it's not reliable. Uh, we don't make any guarantees about it. So for now, at least, don't really rely on it. I highly recommend like push D or seeding into anywhere that you like need to be, if you need to be somewhere to run something from a plan or a task. Um, and the last thing is that the local host target has some nice defaults set to it. So because we know that you're running on localhost, we can make a couple of assumptions about uh, your environment, like that you have Bolt installed. Um, and if you have Bolt installed, then you definitely have an agent. Oh, clicking. Uh, then you definitely have the agent feature. We also know if you have Bolt installed that you probably have Ruby installed, and so we can use your local Ruby. So we set the uh, Ruby interpreter to rbconfig.ruby, which is just the Ruby that is running Bolt. Um, and the local host transport or the local host target also uses the local transport, which means that it basically just shells out. Worth noting, all of these defaults are only for the local host target, like that string is magic, not anything that's running on the local transport. Uh, I said I would cover config precedence. Here it is. So the URI will override everything else. So you, if you have like 
um, user at, let me clear, user at uh, password at hostname colon port. Um, so, the, so all of these will take precedence over um, anything else that you have set. That's kind of the longest, I think, uh, URI. Um, so all of that will override everything else. And then it is command line flags will override any of that. And then inventory config. So like my uh, config here will override that next. Or will, uh, sorry, be default. Override, I'm misusing that. URI is the top. Um, and then the next one down in defaults is command line flags and then inventory <coughs> config. Um, and then my bolts config, which is here. And then lastly, if you're working over SSH, your actual SSH config. So like tilde .ssh config. I'm pretty sure I don't have any secrets in there, but I'm like not 100% sure, so I'm just not gonna open it. <laughs> All right. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is contributing back. So especially because it's Hacktoberfest month, uh, if you haven't registered for Hacktoberfest, you basically have a free t-shirt if you make four pull requests um, in the month of October. It's like hacktoberfest.com probably is the URL. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Bolt is participating. We're trying to get better about encouraging contribution or rather enabling contribution. So making sure that we have really well-groomed issues that are bite-sized that anyone can come by and just do without having to like get all of the context of the Bolt team. Um, but there's lots of ways of contributing back that aren't just writing code for Bolt. Uh, publishing examples, actually, I think is one of the best things that you can do to like help Bolt the project. Um, if you've read our documentation, you know that we definitely don't have enough examples out there. Um, and so, kind of helping us fill that gap, um, either on your own platforms, on a Medium article, or contributing back to the Bolt documentation, which is just in the repo, um, are all, I think, really great ways of helping us uh, bridge that a little bit better, teaching other people to use Bolt as well. Um, filing issues is another big one. So we recently switched from using Jira to track our issues to using GitHub which is very exciting because probably everyone has a GitHub um, and like has made an issue there. If not, it's a lot easier than signing up for Jira. Um, so now filing issues with Bolt is a little bit easier. Um, you can edit or write our documentation. And mostly I think this applies to like finding typos um, or something you see that doesn't seem quite right. Definitely let us know about it um, and we, <sighs> would absolutely love if instead of making an issue for documentation errors, like just put up a PR and we'll totally accept it. Um, again, look for help wanted issues. We're trying to get better at um, labeling issues that we think people could work on um, that are like manageable. Um, and yeah, uh, if you have an idea for something you wanna see, put up a PR, make an issue, and we can talk about what, it, what it'll take to make it happen. Um, there's a couple of resources. Uh, we have documentation. We have a hands-on lab or a guide. It's literally bolt.guide is the URL. Um, we are in Pound Bolt in the Puppet community Slack. We're on GitHub. We have a bunch of videos online if you're looking to learn more about Bolt. And that's it for me. Are there any questions? OK, I see a hand, actually, I think. Never mind. Fake hand, phantom hand, yes. Uh, when it comes to running uh, Puppet Bolt, or rather the Bolt, in, in an enterprise uh, where, say, logging is really important, how do you ensure that the logs from Bolt, uh, from any particular system, uh, don't just disappear after your session's gone? Yeah, I mean, I think like anything, oh, so the question was, if you're running Bolt in Puppet Enterprise, how do you ensure that your logs persist past just getting printed to standard out? Um, I think like anything, it's like the log management for Bolt is primarily up to you. Um, I think for, if you're using Bolt with Puppet Enterprise, there is, 
Okay. Um, I think still, we have a log file that you can configure, which has a default log level as well, and you can configure the log level for the log file and where that goes. Um, and so that will get um, all of the same messages that go to standard out and standard error to the log file. Um, you could also, if you need more complex, like that's just one log file. Um, if you need, and it's uh, appending is also configurable, so you can configure if you want to append every bolt run or not. Um, if you want anything more complex, I think doing your own log, um, like putting things into separate files uh, is not, not always terrible. I once read that it takes 13 seconds. Oh, yes, question. Formulate the question from mine. Okay. Um, hold as of right now, Steve, but if I had it on my laptop and I had the laptop where I had the monitor screen and I first would want to make some changes and wanted to go to a more secure climate configuration, I can do that. Um, coming from the Walmart Pocket app that people did, where they're like looking at like this board and then just putting together the tooling and um, how would you guys recommend that I set up this environment where someone else can then come in? Like, I'm thinking, like, my responsibility would be like the whisper, uh, and once you get the components that are in there, um, there's a concept of a project directory. Like, at what point would I have different project directories? At what point would I have different topic files and modules to integrate them? Like, how would I? Yeah. Yeah. So if I can summarize the question, let me know if I got it. Um, how do you basically allow or like use Bolt with teams where you have multiple people or maybe multiple organizations even trying to act on the same infrastructure with Bolt? And how does that relate to project inventory or project directories? Yeah, I, I, I think I gotcha. Um, so uh, I think that a project directory is aptly named where you should use different project directories for different projects. Um, so when you need your inventory to be different, if you need a separate configuration, I think you should be judicious, or um, I don't know if that's the right word actually, but like make a lot of project directories. It's okay to have more than you necessarily need. Um, I also think that Bolt is really meant to be used mostly as an individual. Uh, and if you want to be using agentless, uh, running things agentlessly across your infrastructure with like teams and with role-based access control, um, that's really where I think using PE makes more sense. Like Bolt is really intended to be like a developer tool um, and Puppet Enterprises for enterprises. Um, so that's where you would get like RBAC uh, for running tasks and things, uh, having everyone be able to share inventory more easily, um, et cetera. If one session of Bolt is connected to a specific machine that it's running and doing things, um, I see because you're able to do Puppet Apply and there's also Puppet Agent on there, Puppet Agent can be running its own. Like how does it handle dependency? Not dependency. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm getting a wrap-up signal. Um, so we check for the Puppet Agent before installing it, so we won't install over your Puppet Agent. Um, but we will apply a catalog over your existing catalogs. So if you, when you do an apply, um, I mean, it'll just be kind of the Wild West, like whatever happens. Uh, if you're like in the middle of two puppet applies, like I don't know, what, probably they'll like compete with each other, and yeah, you might get an error or you might not. Like it's basically a race condition, I think. Um, 
but yeah, we don't, uh, the, the catalog won't like see incompatibilities with any existing Puppet catalog on the agent. It'll just apply it. Um, and with that, uh, I am totally available for questions. We're also, like I said, in Pound Bolt on Slack. Come find me. And thank you so much to everyone who came.